All right, awesome. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Kurt Wagner with Bloomberg, and we're going to be talking privacy this morning. And I have uh, two awesome panelists to, to go deep on privacy with me. We have Brendan Lynch from Airbnb uh, and Meredith Fuchs from Plaid. Meredith, Brendan, how, you, how are you both doing? Thanks for being here. Doing great. Doing Thanks great. for having us. Awesome, awesome. Well, I want to start uh, with a bit of a broad question, but I feel like it might help set the stage for, for our discussion. And, and that is, I'm wondering if both of you can give us a sense of where you feel like the, the regulatory environment is right now with regards to privacy, right? And, and for some background for people, I mean, it's been a very interesting couple of years. Uh, we've seen GDPR, we've seen the CCPA in, in California. Um, I really feel like I cover I cover Meta or, or previously Facebook, and I feel like a lot of this happened, you know, around Cambridge Analytica, like this idea of just like, oh my gosh, there's a big tech company that has our data and it's walking out the door, right? Like, it just feels like the last three years have been kind of watershed for consumer privacy. I'm wondering if you agree. I'm wondering if you can just kind of give us a sense of like, where are we right now in the uh, in the environment of of you know regulating how technology companies use our our data? Sure, um, I'm happy to jump in to get us started. Um, I mean, right now, honestly, something like 88% of consumers are using digital financial tools. And I mention that because it shows the desire of people to have the opportunity to use their data to serve their own needs. And the regulatory environment right now, however, is not, at least in the financial services space, has not completely kept up. Um, we basically need to have some more standards to guide this area. Instead, what's happened in financial services is that the industries had to negotiate bilateral agreements um, and the consumers are not a direct part of that discussion. So we would like to see the regulators helping to make sure that consumers' needs are prioritized. Um, and that's one of the things we're looking for in financial services. Yeah, and if I, I could add to that more broadly, I think, um, Kurt, there's a there's a wave of of regulation and legislation as you've that we've talked about with GDPR and beyond. Um, I think what we're seeing in that is is a few key trend lines that of consistency, even though there's there's variation to deal with at times. Um, but generally speaking, it's about providing greater transparency to users online about what data is collected and how it's used. It's about empowering them to have more control over their personal data. And it's it's ultimately about organizational responsibility to, to do the right thing with data. And that's how I think you can sort of have a through line um, across all of this to get consistency and to be able to design a comprehensive privacy program that addresses not only those trends and the specific rules behind them, but also future proofs you somehow uh, against what's coming next. You know, I had mentioned Meta and Cambridge Analytica because it does feel to me like that was really the start of a lot of this stuff. And we see these big tech companies continually brought to Washington, in particular, um, you know, Facebook and Google. I'm wondering what the trickle down is to companies like yours, right? You would be kind of, I would say, right below those companies. Um, but regulation that's going to impact them is is industry wide. And I'm wondering, you know, when you see the the Facebooks of the world kind of summoned. Do you think this is, is that a good thing for you? Is it good that these kind of big tech players are are kind of, uh, you know, maybe the face of this? Or do you feel like, you know, trying to, to talk about Facebook with, with data protection is not necessarily relevant to everyone else in tech who's, who's trying to do the same thing? Well, I mean, ultimately what consumers really want is they want control of their information and whether it's in um, social media or it's in e-commerce e or it's in financial services, it kind of comes down to similar basics. So I think that this debate and regulators looking at that, this is valuable. Um, one of the things that I would hope would be part of the prioritization though, is thinking about how technology also enables innovation and can really help benefit people. I think that's really kind of the moment that we're in is trying to understand that there's very, good positives to consumers having decision-making power and control over their information. Yeah, I think, you know, what I would say, Kurt, is that there's no doubt that uh, the tech industry and all industries, frankly, are becoming 
tech enabled, um, there's a lot of scrutiny about the collection and use of personal data. Um, survey after survey tells us that people are concerned and they want more control. And, and so we recognize that that's definitely there. Um, a key part of how we approach this is not just about regulation and scrutiny. It's actually very much about trust. It's about sort of earning and maintaining the trust of your users. And that becomes a big driver, um, and certainly for a company like Airbnb, which was ultimately founded on a model of trust, um, privacy is playing into that as a key component of that trust equation. Brendan, I want to ask a question of you specifically because you seem to deal, obviously, at Airbnb, you're dealing with more kind of offline safety and privacy than, than a lot of other companies. Obviously, there is the impact of other companies for offline harm, but you know, you're I'm showing up at someone's house, right? I'm showing up at their their address. Um, how do you kind of balance um, dealing with like the the online part of privacy, right? The the data that you have on your servers, but also with the privacy that that has to to come with um, you know a, a consumer going to a stranger's home to to stay. Yeah, it's definitely uh, a, an additional dimension, I guess, to a traditional online business um, to have this host and guest coming together in the real world. And 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 they're not necessarily people, and they're most often people who've never met before. Um, so there's a, a number of measures and rules that we have in place to protect uh, privacy of those individuals. You know, so for example, um, your last name and your profile photo is not shared, you know, and, until a, a booking is confirmed. And and the host will never see your email address or your phone number or any of those things. Um, so there's this there's, there's we've we've done privacy by design in the system and in the product itself to protect privacy on both sides of that of that marketplace. Um, and then sometimes it's it's making rules and enforcing rules. You know, for example, as we know, there's a lot of smart home technologies being deployed in homes today, and that uh, also does uh, it is used by by some Airbnb hosts. And so we have rules in place to ensure that uh, cameras are are not allowed um, unless they are uh, properly and transparently disclosed, and they're never allowed in places like bedrooms and bathrooms. Um, so those are examples of how we address that. And are these types of, sorry, one follow-up to that. I mean, are these types of kind of physical privacy uh, laws, are those things that, you, that you're coming up with on your own? Are these things that, that are laws? I shouldn't have said laws first. Like, are these actual laws that you're following or do you need um, or do you guys want more like formal regulation around that, that type of stuff? Uh, these are these are things that we've come up with that really fit the context of our particular business that we feel um, protect people well, and and so it's it's a it's a part of building trust in in the whole model, um, and very important for us to do that. Okay, um, Meredith, I wanted to ask you because you used to work, I believe, at the Consumer uh, Financial Protection Bureau, if I'm correct. So you've been kind of on the other side of of this kind of regulatory conversation. I'm wondering what's what's the biggest thing that maybe you surprised you or, or that you've learned kind of moving into more of the, the private sector here as you go through these conversations? Well, I mean, I think one of the things I learned at the CFPB that I think is critical is that there's all sorts of industries that are designed to benefit the industry and they don't always think about consumers. So for example, debt collection or loan servicing were all designed to support the business interests and not the consumer interests. When we're talking about financial services though, where you're trying to benefit individual people, and, and certainly it's the same in many other businesses, it's important to also think about what the consumer needs and the consumer wants. I always think that should be your North Star. So for example, um, in a situation like ours, where we're trying to enable financial services to be delivered to consumers, it really comes down to what the consumer's choice is, what's the service that they want, and how do they want their data to be treated. And part of what is, is important for that is trying to ensure that consumers have the opportunity, they have transparency about who's touching their data, and they have the opportunity to stop data flows when they want to, or delete data if they want to. So I think those are kind of basic principles they're not necessarily in the law everywhere, but you know we are comfortable with 
learning those principles from what we see happening globally and applying them to our business, whether or not the law requires it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like this this idea of um, you know consumers being the priority. It sounds so obvious, right? Of course, of course, the 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 customer is always right, that type of thing. But I do feel that. Consumers have a general, certainly with with the big tech companies, um, a general distrust that maybe they are true, truly, um, you know, the motivation behind some of these things. I'm just wondering if if you can both talk about, um, you know, why is again? It sounds somewhat obvious. Like, how do companies prioritize consumers while simultaneously, you know, trying to grow a business, trying to follow? regulation or, or avoid certain regulations. Um, can you just talk maybe about how that thinking has even evolved over the last couple of years, if it has, or if this has always been, um, you know, the thing we just maybe weren't talking about it as much? I'm happy to start this one. Um, I, I think generally it is it's it's ultimately trying to find that sweet spot of, and, and I think, you know, sort of the Airbnb is a good example where the where trust is such an important part of the success of the business model um, and protecting people's privacy so that they're, they're willing to, to continue to use the platform is crucial. Um, there is definitely angst out there and, and in some cases, you know, um, mistrust. And so I think it's just important to be very principled, um, to explain your principles, and then to really live up to them. And they, in my mind, you know, need to be articulated not in terms of privacy laws, but just more general, um, broader principles, and go beyond in places. So, for example, um, we have our privacy principles published, and the things you would expect about transparency, uh, about control, about having strong security measures in place for the data that's entrusted to us. Um, but we also have one which is about using data for the benefit of our community. And it's to power their experiences, to keep them safe. And we don't sell personal data to anyone. Um, and so those are examples of where you, you, you can make, I think, strong promises and then internalize those in the way that you design your products and your services and your systems to live up to them. Yeah, I mean, it's very similar, I think, for us. I mean, we don't, our product, the, the services that we enable are ones that are selected specifically by consumers because they want financial services. And given the nature of the area, it's really important that there be trust in the work that we're doing. And so, for example, similarly, we don't sell consumers data. It's, you know, we don't monetize their data in, in any way. What we're trying to do is make it possible for them to get what they want and to give them the control when they do that. So we've developed a bunch of different tools to help enable the consumer's consent and to give them the transparency and control. One is when they decide that they want to access a financial service and use Plaid to connect their accounts, they have a consent flow that they go through, which shows that Plaid is involved and gives them an opportunity to see our privacy policy. And then we also have a, an ability for them to go to Plaid portal, which is at my.plaid.com, to stop the flow of data. So it's really putting the tools back in the consumers so that they will feel confident that they're the ones who have the power. Yeah, it does feel like it's a trust thing, you know, to, to state the obvious more than anything, right? If if I don't feel that I can trust you, that's bad business, right? So I, I would say that's probably the greatest argument for why any of this, you know, matters to any, any company. Um, Meredith, I'm, I'm wondering if I could ask you, because so much of financial technology seems to be moving toward the blockchain right now, um, which is, you know, unregulated, it's, it's uh, distributed. I'm wondering, how is that changing what you do, are you guys thinking about the blockchain and how personal data is going to be kind of uh, uh, on the blockchain? Like, is that something that's part of your roadmap at this point? Well, I mean, look, the, all of these technologies make innovation possible, and that's really exciting because it means you can deliver better services for people. But we really do need regulators to be paying attention and to understand how these technologies work, because when you're going to be affecting consumers, the impact on the individual consumer can be really significant. And so I would continue to bring it back to this idea that the regulators need to pay attention and businesses need to develop these core principles early on 
so that they know what should guide them as they're developing their products and they're thinking about how to exploit the technologies. One thing I've noticed is that, you know, the product people and the engineers are always really idealistic and they love what they can create. That's wonderful. And we need to, you know, measure that with also worrying specifically about the consumers. Yeah, I'm sure there's a, a general tension at, at all companies between what is possible to build and what is maybe responsible to build or at least, you know, putting the, the guardrails around it. Brendan, I'm wondering, what about you guys at Airbnb? Are you are you thinking about the blockchain at all? Is this like a uh, you know, uh, an area where there's uh, potential for, for Airbnb to, to kind of move some of that data there? Um, I'm not close to, to any decisions about that. I think what I would do to genericize it is to say there's a lot of, um, you know, new technologies that come along and they pose new challenges for privacy and in some cases opportunities for privacy. And so the important thing is to be able to evaluate those in the direction of the business um, that's what I see Meredith nodding. That's what us privacy professionals do all the time is sort of understand the roadmap of where things are going to, to try and get ahead of what risks might be and how what opportunities there might be able to be to leverage new technologies. And so um, I would approach it uh, in that fashion. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to stick with new technologies. Um, we have just a few minutes left. And I'm going to ask about the metaverse uh, because, you know, what, what, what else could we possibly end this conversation talking about but the metaverse? And I'm wondering, you know, Brendan, I, I feel like um, because Airbnb, because of the experience, the experiential nature of, of what it is that you guys offer, the metaverse feels like something that would be really relevant to you. Um, uh, Meredith, we'll get to you next. But Brendan, I'm wondering, are you guys thinking about the metaverse um, as a, a, an opportunity for Airbnb, and how, how does that play into privacy for you? Yeah, I, again, I'm not close to any decisions on that. We're mostly about people coming to the together in the real world um, and feeling this sense of connection and belonging at, at more of a human level. Um, but I think just, again, generically, if, if, if for any of these new technologies, it's uh, it's a case of thinking ahead, evaluating the privacy risks, and navigating a path through it. Meredith, what about you? I know that commerce is going to be big in, in the metaverse. Um, I, obviously, that that comes with payments and, and the transfer of money. That's where you guys come in. Are you thinking about this at all? I mean, we are, to my knowledge, not currently thinking about entering the metaverse directly, but I think it goes back to the same basics, which is we're talking about people's financial lives, and that's really important. And we want to make sure they know what they're doing, that they have transparency about with whom they're doing business, and that there's protections in place so that, they're, that they have trust that they can actually take care of themselves. Um, so wherever it is, whether it's in the metaverse, whether it's bricks and mortar, whether it's over the traditional digital rails, um, those are the kinds of principles we're going to come back to. Yeah. Let's finish full circle. We have about a minute and a half left. So maybe 30 seconds from each of you. I'm wondering, you know, we started talking about what's the regulatory environment for privacy. It's been a busy couple, you know, two or three years. What is the what does the future look like here for us? I mean, is there going to be more uh, CCPA style uh, laws around the country? Is there going to be more GDPR style laws? Uh, you know, in in um, places outside of Europe. Like, I guess thirty seconds. If you could just kind of give us a sense of where you're, um, you think we're all headed, that would be great. Maybe Meredith, you want to start. Sure. Um, I mean, I think all those laws that you referenced all come down to the same thing, which is, you know, consumers want to control how their data is used and they want to be able to make the choice themselves. The thing that I think we are going to see that's a little bit different, I mentioned earlier that the CFPB is doing a rulemaking on data portability and consumer access to their own data. What's different about that rule is it's not just about limiting the use of data, it's about enabling the use of data for consumer benefit. So we are really excited to see the CFPB take this rulemaking to its finish because we think it's going to make great things available to all sorts of consumers. Uh, yeah, Brandon? I would say just I think, yes, we can expect more uh, regulations, rulemaking, legislation, um, very much along the lines of greater transparency, 
um, empowering individuals, organizations being accountable. And the way to get ahead of it is to build a comprehensive privacy program um, it's based on a set of standards that really take into account all these requirements and then embed it in, in every part of your business to ultimately build trust with your users.